Good afternoon, folks. Glad you are all here. Uh, I'm Wayne Lutters, and it is my great honor to welcome uh, Naila Nasir to the University of Maryland, albeit virtually, for our Dean's Lecture Series. Uh, Dr. Nasir is the sixth president of the Spencer Foundation, which funds educational research nationally. Uh, she's a member of the National Academy of Education and a fellow of the American Educational Research Association, for which uh, she recently served as president. Uh, Dr. Nasir has been on the faculty at UC Berkeley, serving in many roles, but uh, as chair of African American Studies, and later as their second vice chancellor for equity and inclusion. Uh, Dr. Nasir has authored a number of influential books on the intersection of identity and education, uh, including We Dare Say Love, Supporting Achievement in the Educational Life of Black Boys, and she's here today to challenge us on the future of learning. A quick reminder to everyone that uh, this session is recorded. We have the Q&A feature. Please enter your questions at any time during Dr. Nasir's talk. Uh, we'll uh, collect them, moderate them, and have a rip-roaring discussion at the end. Uh, and then we do have, I believe, the uh, subtitles and captioning uh, coming on. So marvelous, Dr. Nasir is yours. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> welcome everyone, it's good to, um, good to be here in the space with you, even though I can't see you, which is always so weird <laughs> with these webinars, but you know, welcome. Um, I'm gonna talk with, with you today about the future of learning. And at the core of my talk is really a central concern. How do we organize education and learning systems for a multicultural democracy? How do we build systems of education and of learning that transcend and transform how we've been doing education and that are designed to support rich and engaging learning, critical thinking skills, and to fully educate young people in ways that honor their whole humanity, their developmental needs, and their families and communities. So it's a big refresh <laughs> I'm talking about. And, and you know, you might argue, having even said the bit that I've just said, that the vision I'm crafting in this talk isn't rooted in the reality of education systems, those that we have now, nor is it attendant to their significant constraints. And I guess I want to start by saying that this is about visioning something different. And I say this all the time. If we as scholars can't envision a future that we want, those of us who are paid to think and vision and think beyond the present moment, then who's gonna be able to do that work and hold that vision? So I think that that's a, it's a core activity of scholarship and researchers and, and in some ways a responsibility. So I see creating this vision as a necessary precondition to change. A vision is about creating a blueprint for something that does not yet exist, imagining something we cannot yet see. And in that spirit, this talk is about what we can imagine together for learning spaces, early childhood, K-12, higher education and beyond. But it's also a vision rooted in the wisdom of the past in the glimpses of the powerful spaces for learning and being that have always existed informally in snippets sometimes across cultures and communities. So I'm talking about, you know, the title of my talk is the future of learning, right? So I'm talking about the future. When I use the, use the word future, I mean kind of a common sense notion of the future, something off on the horizon that's not yet here. But the future is also what we steward for the generations to come. Our children, our grandchildren, human kin of no relation. I, I also think here about the work in African-American, indigenous and queer futurity and the ways that it signifies more than just a time space not here yet, but also hope, optimism, joy, possibility yet, yet unrealized. The term learning is also one that can be defined in a variety of ways. I, I started my career by studying cognition in out of school learning spaces. So for me, learning has always meant something beyond school. Learning is a natural act. It's what babies do as their human inheritance, interact with the environment, learn to be and do in relation to their caregivers and the community around them. And learning also has meaning as a part of the black tradition where the seeking of knowledge, the act of learning was a radical act, an act of self-determination of community uplift. And so the question isn't how do we get people to learn? People always have and always will learn. The question is how do we make our educational systems humane and connecting places that provide enriching forms of learning? 
the kind that contributes to civically minded, empowered, joyful, generous, and intellectually engaged people. So today I'm gonna to start with a few grounding ideas. Then my talk is gonna make three key points. One, that we can theorize learning in ways that respects diversity. And here I mean diversity of culture, diversity of thought and multiplicity and supports people thriving. So just the very way we understand learning is really critical. Second, that building on that understanding, we can transform equitable education and learning systems that provide access to robust learning. And then finally, I'll give a bit of attention to what the role of research is in all of that. So if those things are true about what we wanna create, how are researchers a part of supporting and acting, creating a space um, for that kind of vision for education? And I, and I wanna signal this, this talk is about hope and about imagining something different. And, and while I'm gonna be focused on hope and this vision of what we could build, I do so very mindfully of the issues of power that underlie learning, as well as how power and privilege reproduce themselves in our current system. These structures of power are not easy to change and they resist and morph. And at the same time, I'm aware of the power of a people who want something better for the next generation and of the power we hold individually and collectively as a research community, and I'm suggesting that we not cede our power, that we garner it and use it for collective good. So a few grounding ideas. Um, the first is rooted in my own kind of tradition in, in the scholarship around Black education. And we learn a lot from looking backwards, I think. You know, education, and in particular, the education of Black folks in this country and folks from other marginalized communities has always been a contentious endeavor. And I don't think we can ever talk about learning or schooling without holding some of the fundamental tensions and contradictions. On the one hand, schools have been a social mobility mechanism whereby Black people have used education as a means to better their material conditions personally and as a community. On the other hand, we know that the historical and contemporary record shows that schools were designed to be at best an unequal system, right? Under segregation, black schools were vastly underfunded and under resourced. There was a brief period in the late 70s and 1980s where racial disparities in schooling experiences and outcomes improved during the time of the implementation of desegregation, such as it was, but they've been steadily worse in the decades since. And, um, and we know now that the level of segregation we see in school systems now is worse than in 1954 when Brown versus Board of Education passed. However, so there's a dismal picture there, right? But when we look more closely, we also find there are important lessons to be gained about teaching and learning from the period of schooling in Black communities in the era of segregation. Scholarship by educational historians, Jim Anderson, Vanessa Settle Walker, um, most recently, um, there's a new scholar, Jarvis Givens, who wrote a fabulous book on this, have been documenting Black schools across the South, where teachers and administrators in the era of, of segregation held high expectations for students, where intellectual engagement was valued, where pedagogy was rooted in love, and where there were deep and abiding connections between schools, families, and communities. This work has also revealed the belief in learning as a means to liberation as a means to both psychological and actual freedom, as important to developing one's highest human potential. We can learn from these rich traditions of educational institutions in Black communities to inform the kinds of schools and systems we need to create today, systems that center wholeness, identity, socio-emotional development, and the connections between academic content, intellectual development, and commitment to community and nation. And this work may be necessary now more than ever. In her recent book, The Trayvon Generation, Elizabeth Alexander focuses in on the experiences of Black young people who have grown up in this era of police killings and the very public violence towards Black men, women, and youth. She beautifully articulates the developmental needs, without using that term because she's a poet, of this generation of young people, the mental health needs, the deep and wide experience of trauma, the lack of trust in institutions and systems, and they need to be seen and heard and for wholeness to be stewarded. Which in some ways brings us to this moment. Um, building the systems we need in this moment holds some challenges. The 
COVID-19 has, has not only wreaked havoc, isolation, illness, loss of loved ones, depression in so many lives. And I feel like we're even just now seeing some of the deep impacts as we, as we move, I don't wanna say out of it, but as we move through it together. Um, but the pandemic also heightened and deepened our awareness of what many have called the three other pandemics of our time, systemic racism, the climate catastrophe, and the economic crisis. In this context, we've seen educational inequality, inequality also deepen. We've seen the effects of existing inequalities become even more extreme. And we are now facing intersections with the climate crisis as extreme weather and climate disasters affect marginalized communities most profoundly. Our time is marked by these crises and, the, and, and resulting in the deepening of long-term societal fissures, health disparities, astronomical student loan debt, housing insecurity, and the decline of public institutions and infrastructure. COVID and the intersections of these crises have impacted education in many, many ways. Right? Teachers and schooling are coping with the academic and emotional effects of the pandemic, low teacher morale, problematic working conditions, people leaving the profession in mass, bitter conflicts over what's called critical race theory, the rights of trans students, and ongoing efforts to privatize educate, public educational resources. And I think what's clear is that past solutions will not serve us to have the future that we want. And while these times are incredibly challenging, they may also be creating the desire, the demand, and the readiness for something else. People have talked um, in my field about this opening for us to imagine something new. And we've seen evidence of this on a number of fronts, right? Including increasing commitments to equity. We're also seeing a pretty vast backlash to that right now, but cracks in the accountability era logics and advances in educational research that help us understand the complexity of learning and how to best support learning. But in order to realize the power of this moment, we must change our frame. Heather McGee recently wrote this beautiful book called The Sum of Us, in which she looks over time at several major public health issues, access to good jobs and pensions, purchasing a home, clean air, access to high quality schools. And for each issue, she notes how racism at key moments in history prevented an opening of access right at the point where it would have served black folks or folks from other marginalized communities. And thus in closing down of access for marginalized communities, access was also shut down for poor whites or women or others who might benefit, thus creating structures that work against the goal of having a prosperous society. Her point is that everyone loses when we double down on inequality, both materially and psychologically. And one of the greatest lies is that supporting one group comes at the cost of the well being of other groups. She writes, the task ahead then is to unwind this idea of a fixed quantity of prosperity and replace it with what she's come to call solidarity dividends, gains available to everyone when they unite across racial lines in the form of higher wages, cleaner air, and better funded schools. This is a profound argument for multiplicity for creating systems that provide many ways for folks to succeed and thrive. And it must be at the base of how we imagine the kinds of education and learning systems that are possible. So recall my three main points, which I'm about to jump into now. Um, we can theorize learning in ways that respects diversity and multiplicity and supports thriving. So I'm gonna talk about how we understand what learning is. We can transform education and learning systems to become equitable and that provide access to robust learning. And that if our expertise, if our research expertise is, is harnessed, it can support this work in creating equitable systems. And I'll probably focus much more on the first two points for our time together today. So, um, so I wanna take up the first point and consider how we theorize learning for a multicultural democracy. And at the core of this is to understand learning as a culturally rooted and whole person endeavor. We've theorized learning a lot in, in, in the field of, of psychology and education over the last hundred years or so. And when we look back over those hundred years, we kind of can identify three waves of theorizing. 
um, behaviorism, which conceived of learning as being about the accumulation of facts and skills learned through processes of reinforcement, think root memorization and recital. Cognitivism, which saw learning as the storage, retrieval, and processing of information, kind of right as computers came of age, right? You're thinking about the brain as a computer, and saw teaching then as cultivating active exploration in the service of real world tasks, project based learning. Sociocultural theory viewed learning as transformations of participation and identity. And here's where there's a layering in of kind of the social world into how we understand learning. So it's not just stuff happening in your head, but it's the way you're orienting yourself in the world. That saw learning as um, coupling how to know and how to do with learning how to be. From this perspective, teaching must attend to the social routines and connections that support learning. And I would argue that each of these theories contributes partial truths. What we really need is a theory of learning that integrates these insights and holds at core a holistic perspective of learning and of young people. And there's another problem from the prior science that we need to attend to. What is required is a science of learning that takes multiplicity, difference, and cultural context very seriously. This has not been our history as a field. You've heard of the weird problem, right? Our science has been built on a focus on Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic people, weird people. 96% <laughs> of the studies in psychology are conducted with weird samples, even though those people reflect only 12% of the student population. Megan Bang notes, this broad scale sample bias results in a field level flattening of our understandings of human diversity and cultural variation. As a result of lack of diversity in samples and researchers, Scientific instruments and measures of intelligence has often projected deficit conceptions across cultural communities with Western researchers presuming their own frames of reference as the universal norm. What she's arguing here is, is that we need to better attend to the cultural diversity with our science. And to not do so leaves us, to, leaves us a risk of having a science that's rooted in deficit theories and misunderstandings, thus, not a very accurate science of learning. So this is not just about, like sometimes people think about culture as um, and with respect to learning as including those other folks. <laughs> this is actually about a fundamental science that, um, that addresses the human variation in, um, in learning. So with my colleagues, um, Carol Lee Roy P and Maxine Dipkini de Royston, we um, wrote a big handbook, uh, edited a big handbook called the Handbook of the Cultural Foundations of Learning. And when it was finished, we thought like, this is such an amazing collection of scholarly, theoretical and academic work. And, um, but what is, how do we distill this down into a few key readable, shareable principles? So this was our effort at that. We argue um, in a couple of pieces that learning is rooted in the evolutionary, biological and neurological systems of our minds and bodies. It's integrated with all other aspects of development, cognition, emotion, the formation of identity. It is shaped by everyday life cultural activities, both in and out of school and across the lifespan and experience in our bodies through coordination with social others. And these are kind of basic principles of how we understand what learning is universally. And I'll just say a bit about each of the principles. The first, learning is rooted in evolutionary, biological, and neurological systems. Learning is a pervasive and fundamentally human activity that arises out of our biological need to be connected to social others and to adapt to the environment. Because sometimes people pit the biological versus the social. No, it's actually one and the same. Just as one example, human adaptability is underscored by evidence from the neurosciences, which find that not only are human brains malleable, but the brain is also quite social. We learn from implicit and observational stimuli. In fact, our brains are hardwired to learn implicitly and observationally from others and to do so from a place of emotional connection. So even those systems we viewed as organic, biological, neurological, and evolutionary are also cultural and social in nature. Switching, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, Second, learning is integrated with all other aspects of development, emotion, identity, cognition. Uh, Mary Helen Imordino Yang writes, our schools tend to be preoccupied with what kids know and can do. However, it seems to be 
how kids think and feel, their dispositions of heart and mind that have been the strongest effect on their learning, civic engagement, personal well being, and even brain development. There's a substantial body of research that underscores this point. When a sense of belonging and emotional safety are present, and when identities, including racial identities, are integrated into the classroom, learners are better able to engage and learn. It's also important to recognize what happens when this isn't true. Membership in marginalized gender, racial ethnic disability status, language proficiency, or immigration status groups can mean that one must manage environments that are not set up to meet one's developmental needs and indeed are sometimes designed to reinforce marginalization by not meeting those needs. For example, my own work has noted the conundrum facing black boys during adolescence, precisely when adolescents have developmental needs for competence and autonomy, care and community, and a sense of identity and place in the world, they are too often treated in schools with suspicion as the other and are met with a profound lack of care. The big point here is that psychosocial development is integral to learning, not a nice to have that layers on top of a set of universal cognitive processes. Learning is shaped in our everyday life, cultural practices and across the life course. So this is rather obvious, <laughs> though we rarely attend to it in schools. Learning happens in many settings, including and beyond schools. This perspective acknowledges that learning unfolds on multiple pathways across lives at once. And that learning at best is a tapestry where what one has learned in one setting like communities is expanded and built upon in another setting like schools in ways that honor and enrich the experience of learners. And yet learning is not neutral. We are more willing to see learning and practices associated with formal learning spaces, less inclined to see the complexity of learning that occurs elsewhere. My, my mentor, Mike Rose, wrote a lot about the cognitive work of blue collar, the cognitive work that happened in blue collar work as a way to point out that we're not noticing the important intellectual and cognitive capacities that happen in settings outside of school. Thus, learning must be viewed as occurring ubiquitously and as being naturally occurring in people's lives. At the same time, we have to recognize that the ways we silo and privilege school learning, often to the exclusion of a range of ways of being and knowing that show up life-wide. And finally, we experience learning, learning is experienced in our bodies and through social coordination with others. Uses of the body and of representational systems like language, as well as nonverbal communication like gestures, eye gaze and bodily orientation, joint attention and the negotiation of meeting are key to how learning activities are organized and coordinated. This includes language, which I noted, which relates to learning in many ways, right? It's a direct mediator of learning and it positions learners into identities, thus operates as a tool by which power is instantiated and negotiated. These embodied and representational aspects of learning matter for the kinds of learning settings we would optimally design. So if we know that learning, if we know what learning is and we hold at core this complex, multifaceted, adaptive concept of learning, and we take seriously that identity, emotion, and social engagement are core to learning, then how would we teach? And how would we create education and learning systems to support this kind of learning? It's important as we think about building systems to note that our systems were not designed with this kind of learning in mind, and were certainly not designed for all students to learn. Linda Darling Hammond sums it up as follows. Quote, the belief that only some students are worthy of investment and that students need to be ranked and sorted according to their different levels of potential is deeply rooted in the organizational design of our schools, our funding priorities, our testing and grading policies, and our system of tracking students. It's true in our higher ed systems as well. If we are thinking about the public function of schooling and education, the notion that experiences of education should be designed to support our multicultural democracy, then we must also think about the kinds of skill sets and mindsets that people need to be engaged and critical participants in that democracy. This was the focus of a recent National Academy of Education report, tying learning in the disciplines to civic engagement. And here again, the kinds of learning we support, critical reading and writing, understanding and evaluating sources of evidence, 
the ability to take other people's perspectives matter to our very ability to educate for participation in a multicultural democracy. Okay, so what should such education and learning systems look like? In a recent series in the, that ran in the Phi Delta Kappa magazine, um, we at, at Spencer invited scholars to imagine with us the kinds of education systems we could create with a time horizon of 25 years if we put equity at the core. So I encourage you to read that set of papers and the responses from others in the field. The articles taken together articulate a vision that includes a K-12 curriculum designed to prepare all young people for civic engagement, equitable education systems of assessment grounded in cultural theories of learning, century student work, connecting families, communities, and schools. Um, there's a piece that talks about the agency and diversity of learners and respect and what it looks like to provide purposeful, connected, and authentic learning. There's a, an article that focuses on um, community-based leadership in schools and what it looks like to honor community and families, um, as well as con a consideration of what the policies would be that would bring that into fruition. And I, I would argue that this set of papers sets an ambitious and exciting vision, but here's the thing about an exciting vision, especially one that breaks from what we've done in the past. The very act of imagining can spark kind of a cognitive backlash rooted in the way things are now, the way things have always been, and the technical constraints of current systems. So creating something new will require a radical imagination to think that something better is actually possible, the faith to believe we can use our power to bring it into being, and then the will to do it. And there's been a lot of work in the field over the last few years by some innovative groups thinking about how we build on the science of learning and development and our commitments to an equitable multicultural democracy to design education systems in alignment with those values and goals. Here, I've represented the frameworks from two of these groups, the Sold Alliance and the Bell Framework for Equitable Learning um, coming out of the Bell Network. Both of these frameworks underscore several key features of education and learning systems that support rich, culturally sustaining, and rigorous learning. They call for new types of relations with families and communities, centering rigorous and rich learning, critical intellectual skills and mindsets, safety, belonging, cultural affirmation, and love, transform systems for discipline and restorative justice and shared power, and positive developmental relationships and spaces for identity development. These principles infuse both teaching practices in the classroom, culturally affirming pedagogy and curricula, intellectually rich, relevant, and challenging instruction, as well as, as, well as school level organizational features, looping, detracking, teacher learning communities, restorative justice practices. So much more I could say about each of these frameworks and the kinds of practices and structures that they elaborate, but, but for my purposes here, I'll leave it at these kind of high level features of equitable learning systems. These offerings for how we can redesign our education system are compelling and provide a roadmap. Gloria Latson Billings cautions us that this work, however, is more than about techniques and structures and must entail a consideration of the underlying beliefs that teachers and school systems hold about young people. Writing about the extraordinary teachers she studied, she writes, quote, rather than techniques or teaching strategies, I learned that what the teachers shared was a set of underlying beliefs that drove their teaching. A set of beliefs about themselves and others, about how to structure social relations, and about the nature of knowledge. These beliefs help the teachers focus on improving student learning, cultivating cultural competence, and supporting socio-political or critical consciousness. I could ignore the actual strategy, lecture, discussion, cooperative groups, and more clearly see how the belief systems were driving what and how they taught, end quote. So I think holding this in mind is really critical as we think about the kinds of um, schools and education systems that we need. And all of this classroom and school level work requires a set of enabling conditions or aspects of the ecology of learning spaces and systems that all must be pulling in the same direction. That broader ecology must involve the teacher pipeline, thinking about accreditation requirements, pre and in-service development, recruitment, retention, teacher wellness, all of that huge, huge, huge right now as we think about you know, maintaining people and recruiting people into the field. It must think about relations with communities and families, a multi-tiered engagement and support 
It must think about adequate and equitable funding to schools and districts and many districts and states are um, experimenting with equitable funding formulas in ways that show promise. It must think about school and district practices that support into racial integration within and across neighborhoods, diverse curricula, ethnic studies, and a learning ecology inclusive of after-school community and summer experiences. All of what needs to happen can't happen within the walls of traditional schools. And finally, in, um, and this has been increasingly the focus of attention in the field, it must think about assessment. How is it that we evaluate what students know, think about what students should know, and create systems that actually get at those things. I often say of assessment, we measure the things that we can see, not the things that are most important to us. It's like the, the, that cartoon about the guys looking for his keys under the street lamp late at night. And um, somebody comes over and says, oh, you're looking for your keys. Is this where you dropped them? No, I dropped them over here, but this is where the light is better. Right? It's kind of a, a, a similar thing around assessment. And, you know, you could give a lecture about any of these boxes and in, including assessment. And um, again, just want to point to some of the great work happening in the field. Scholars like Ed Gordon, Bill Penuel, Bob Mislevy, Jim Pellegrino, Randy Bennett from ETS are really thinking about the kinds of assessment systems that align with what we know about learning and what and which contribute to equity rather than doubling down on inequity. It's important to note that building the kinds of education and learning systems that we've been discussing require us to lean into a solidarity dividend frame of the kind Heather McGee articulated. In other words, when education systems are designed to not hoard opportunity for an elite subset, but rather to value the ways and being and learning of young people in multiple communities, then we all win in the form of better and more fully educated people prepared to take on the challenging social and scientific challenges of our time. And bringing such systems into fruition is both a matter of what we know from the science, but also a matter of political will. It is entire, it's entirely clear that the current system will not carry us into the future as a nation. And the question is, are we willing to fully engage schools as a key aspect of building a true multicultural democracy? And you could, you could question now whether we're united in our desire for such a thing, but I'm gonna take that as, as a given for the purposes of this talk. So I was gonna say a couple of things about the role of research. Um, so much to say here. And, it, and it's tricky because research has a, its own um, sordid and troubled past, right? So if you think about the historical record about how communities of color have intersected with researchers, for me, it brings up glaring examples that we know well, right? In medical research, the Tuskegee experiments, but also the smaller scale harms, such as in education research where scholars misrepresented or misunderstood families, communities, and teachers, or develop and implemented interventions that were harmful or where studies perpetuated negative stereotypes. So I'm not arguing that research has um, mm, a spotless reputation in history in its desire to support and create equity. Um, but, but I think, well, I'm trying to find my place in the notes. Um, but I think there's potential there that is not yet realized, right? Um, and it's important for us to really lean into that. So let's see these things, trying to get us to a close so I can take your questions. Um, let me just say that as I was preparing this talk and these thoughts, it, it almost leads to a little bit of, a, of an existential conundrum, right? Can schools that were founded on principles of exclusion and oppression be redeemed and transformed? And similarly, can a research field with traditions rooted in exploitation and neglect for the young people in communities that are most marginalized re be, be rebirthed into something fundamentally different than that? And can we imagine a world where policy supports what we know from research, even as we find ourselves in an era of the declining significance of evidence? And if the answer to those questions is a resounding no, then we may as well all go home. Right? So for me, the answer has to be yes, because our collective belief in that yes is why we are here. And if that's the case, then we have to give rise to an ethic of research and a way of doing our work that's in alignment with and in service to 
the kinds of deep and rich learning supported by systems committed to equity that we've been discussing. So that's the place I'm starting from in these last set of comments. So research has many potential uses um, when it comes to thinking about its impact on policy practice and knowledge building. We have used research to understand what works, for whom, under what conditions, and why, um, to describe existence proof cases, to find levers for improvement. Um, those have been many of the key uses of research. We also use research to inform new designs, practices, and policies. And less often, perhaps, these last two bullets, to offer conceptual insight on an issue or problem or to understand how things came to be and to question assumptions and reimagine possibility. So I'm arguing here that we must hold the full range of purposes of education research in mind and thus broaden how we think about research usefulness. Given that, there's some things we probably need to stop doing and some things we probably should be doing more of as, as scholars and particularly as education researchers. Um, I'm, I won't go deeply into any of this because it, it'll be familiar to many of you. Um, we mostly do our work in isolation and pretty narrow forms of isolation. Isolation in our research labs with our students and colleagues, isolation from the places where communities and practitioners and policymakers are thinking about what education systems need. So we are both siloed. We build our work based on how it's different from work of the past, not how it builds on. And we are disconnected from the places where our work should really matter. We also, as a field, have had an overemphasis on intervention models with the, with the theory of change that if you create something that works in one place and then prove that it works, and scale it up, that's how education change happens, though we now have lots and lots of evidence that that's not at all how education systems change happens. Um, we also have focused as a field primarily on short-term and small-scale studies, partly because of how the funding mechanisms operate and um, doesn't give rise to us thinking beyond a three to five year time horizon. So it doesn't give rise to us thinking ambitiously as a field. Um, and so there's some things we probably need to be doing better and differently, centering equity and asset framing, collaborating more, engaging in work that is interdisciplinary, multi-method, and that integrates rather than dissects, um, taking on more ambitious studies and focusing on implementation and systems change. And many of these um, ideas uh, come from and align with this recent report that was done at the National Academy of Sciences and Engineering and Medicine on the future of education research. So I'm gonna bring us to a close and just say that those changes that we're arguing need to happen in research to support those visions of education um, have implications for research training, how we bring people into the field, for academic incentives, how we decide who's tenured and what programs of research are tenurable, and for the research and development infrastructure, which in education is um, pales in comparison to the infrastructure in fields like medicine or engineering. Um, so there's lots of kind of systemic structural changes that would need to take place to create the conditions that we've been talking about. Finally, to bring it to a close, the vision I've shared with you all today will require more intentional coherence and collaboration on multiple levels. That includes understanding the complexity and multiplicity of learning and development, building systems that are aligned with what we know about learning and the properties of equitable systems and to advance scholarly work to flesh out our, our vision and figure out a roadmap to implementation in, in our complex systems with others, including and beyond the research community. But it'll also require another kind of intention, one rooted in creating loving systems. And so I'll end where I started. We are having a collective moment in education. And it's one of those rare moments, not unlike where we are with climate change or racial injustice, where it seems clear that our choice is to do the same thing and perish or to figure out a new way of being and doing so that we might all thrive. It is a time for radical hope and for collective action. And I will stop there. Great, thank you very much. A uh, reminder to our folks here that uh, the Q&A function, uh, so the Q&A button on your Zoom screen allows you to queue up a question. A few folks have dropped some things in chat. I will put those in, but let's go ahead and get the conversation started. Okay. Uh, we'd like to start with John, who's covering some issues around what an individual's role is in all of this. Uh, John mentions as a lecturer, faculty member, 
there are parts I cannot control, right? The content of my class, the delivery methods, the activities in my class. I try to use methods that are good and increase learning. I try to measure learning. But when I sort by gender or race, what I don't see is the equity and outcomes. And in part, that's because I can't control what's going on with these students now and their 18 plus year journey to get here. So how can I stay excited about staying with these uh, methods around equity if it still feels like I'm fighting the rest of the world? Infectious hope. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's a great question. I mean, I always say about this that you, we, we can all only control the things we can control, but classrooms are powerful, powerful spaces. And, and you, you need not go any further for most of us than our own journey. Like most of us can think of that one person, that one teacher at some point in our journey that said, wow, you are really good at this, or you really have a very special kind of potential that made you feel like you could be smart and a learner in spaces where you hadn't felt that before. So I wouldn't underestimate the power, of the, the power to inspire and the power to connect. And, and I worry that, that, yes, there are extreme structural inequities in our society that face us in every classroom we stand in from early childhood all the way up. But if that's our frame, then we view our students through that frame and sometimes make assumptions that may not even be true about their history, about why they're disengaged, about what's brought them to this moment. We did a study once in a high school um, at, at the district's request because they were seeing that they were trying very hard to detrack their um, STEM classes at the high school level. And they opened up the classes and they tried to recruit students in and students didn't come. And they thought, wow, we really have a pipeline problem. Students aren't ready for these courses. They're not getting the preparatory early math. And they brought us in to help figure this out. Well, we interviewed families and students and they said, oh no, we can do the work. We're not going into that white harmful space for our kids. <laughs> and so sometimes the diagnosis is informed by assumptions we bring. So I would just say, um, John, to, to lean into the power that you do have, which is in your classroom, you can create a space where those even differences of, um, of prior experience with, a, with, a, with content doesn't become a delineating line, doesn't become the thing that defines who's smart and who's not smart. Um, I'll just say one more thing about this. I wrote a book with um, a group of high school math teachers in the San Francisco Bay Area who had created an equity pedagogy in math. And one of the things they saw as their job was to have activity structures, problems, um, content that everyone could come to equally, and then to teach that content in ways that didn't privilege kids who may have had a, a stronger math teacher in the eighth grade that you can actually powerfully in your classroom create the structures for everyone to learn and engage um, in ways that are valuable to them and to the classroom community. Great, right, thank you. You may have just answered Andy's question in the process of are there some systems that are doing this well now that we can look to as exemplars? Yeah, there are lots of systems. I would I always send people to um, LPI, the Learning Policy Institute, because they do such a great job of lifting up examples and they have all these wonderful reports of places in the country where really great things are happening. Um, so there are, there are lots of places where great things are happening. There are lots of places where abysmal things are happening, but, <laughs> but there are lots of bright spots. And I think we sometimes don't talk about them enough. Um, I'm thinking of, um, I've been working recently with a superintendent in, Cajon Valley, California, who post pandemic created summer schools that were designed in deep collaboration with families and communities. And when you, and, and centered on joy, because that's what families wanted for their kids coming out of the pandemic, right? They taught the courses outside. It was a complete different model of, of um, how to deliver what young people needed. Um, so I think there are really great things and great models of these things happening in lots of lots of places. Illinois as a state, um, a couple of years ago, passed an equity, equitable funding formula that, that um, divvies state funds to districts in a way that takes to, to account deeply the needs of the learners rather than the property tax base of the communities. It's not perfect, but there are many um, districts and, and, and school systems moving in these kinds of directions. So again, I send you to Learning Policy Institute website uh, for places to find bright spots and great examples. 
Good resource. Uh, thank you. We have a couple of questions about uh, kind of Spencer and its visions. We'll hold those for just a moment. Uh, MV's patiently been uh, waiting for this question. Uh, so we'll get this one in first around kind of the future and technology's role in this. So your insights mm -hmm. about psychosocial requirements for learning seem to raise important questions about virtual learning. Can you discuss this further? That's such a good question. And I'm sure on lots of people's minds right now. Um, so I have... Um... I have a bunch of kids, my, my, they're mostly adults, but I have one kid who's still in high school. He's a senior this year. So the pandemic happened at the end of his ninth grade year and his entire 10th grade year, because we're in public schools in Illinois. And, um, and he's one of those people that just did not learn virtually. Like it was, <laughs> it was not good <laughs> in school, but when he logged off class, he had this whole set of things he was learning around cybersecurity. He went online and found modules and, and he became an expert over the course of the pandemic. So, right? So like, what do we mean by virtual learning? And I, and I, and I think of that as an example because it's about virtual learning that's, that is school um, turned virtual versus virtual learning that's about all of these available resources where you can explore things and find things that are aligned with your interests. We also know about virtual learning in higher education that it creates lots of space for people who are working parents, who are, you know, who have jobs and whole lives to give access. So I think we have to take these things complexly, both in terms of how they meet the needs of people within systems and about how we set up virtual classrooms in ways that still give us that human piece. I talked to a preschool teacher um, Right at the at, at right as schools were moving back from being virtual to being back in person, and she talked about how maybe it was preschool, it was preschool, it may have been kindergarten. She talked about how important it was for her to see her students in their homes and work with their families in different ways, and the technology afforded that. So I, I think that you know technology is relatively neutral. It's how we use it. It's how we set it up, and I think it can very much be a tool for connection and for equity and for learning. And it can also be potentially alienated, alienating and disconnecting, depending on, on how we use it. Great. Uh, the next two, are, I'll put two questions together here, uh, are about practically what we do to help prepare people for that. So Amani asked, if, uh, can you name some things you think should be included in teacher preparation programs that better prepare teachers for these kind of humanizing learning experiences that would help our students thrive? And a follow on to that is, and how is this different from current intervention models? What's the this in that question? Uh, these humanized learning experiences. Okay. Um, so teacher preparation programs um, are one, there's a huge diversity and variety of them these days. Um, so if we think, if I think what I know best is university preparation, university-based preparation programs. Uh, well, the first thing that comes to mind is that, and we were, we just had a convening here, at the, I'm in my office at the foundation. We just had a convening here at the foundation yesterday and the day before. Um, and Christine Sleater was here and we were having a side conversation about teacher preparation. And she was making the point that one of the really important things about teacher preparation is that we are teaching teachers in the way we want them to engage with learners in their classrooms. So that would suggest if we want humanizing teaching experiences that are connected and rooted in um, relationships and identity, that that's how we set up teacher education programs as well. Mm -hmm. So that we kind of show through our example what, um, what humanizing classrooms look and feel like. Most, most of us haven't experienced that. So to create an experience of that in teacher preparation program is really important. Um, I would also argue that such programs need to be deeply grounded in our understandings of development and learning. That's development is not mandatory. For most teacher preparation programs, it may be for elementary ed, but certainly not um, secondary credentials. So I think having that as an important part of the curriculum is really, really critical. And I think we need school sites where teachers are do their student teaching, where they are exposed to these kinds of environments and understand how to work in this way, because it is a different way of approaching teaching, learning, learners, families, communities. And oftentimes what happens is people are trained trained in a certain way 
in their in their programs and then they enter the teaching force and they're taught oh no we don't do any of that here that's that you know that's that university stuff so we need also to create that consistency of experience um with respect to the what was the second part of the question how is that fundamentally different than some of the ways that we approach interventions now interventions is a bit of a trigger word <laughs> um because a lot of times when we say intervention, what we're trying to do is change people. Um, we're trying to intervene and make teachers behave differently. We're trying to intervene and have families show up differently rather than thinking about how our systems hit the lives of teachers and families and communities. So I do think there are some, but, but if I take the positive spin on interventions, it's about creating new ways and better ways of doing things. Um, there are some interventions that that do this that focus on these kind of humanizing perspectives, certainly. So I don't think um, what I was saying earlier about intervention models of research is that that scale up is actually not how education change happens. It's not that we create something small. We tell people, oh, look at this great thing. It really works. And then in mass, people start to do it. There's so many constraints and policies and professional practices that um, that scale up just isn't the way isn't the way policy change happens. That's the point I was making around um, around interventionist research. Great, thank you. We have a two parter around research here. Uh, Stephanie's curious around if you have some examples of the really ambitious studies that are happening now. What's really exciting you? You know, that's so funny. I can never answer that. I ask that question all the time and I keep saying I need to keep a list of them in my back pocket. What people normally ask me is what is Spencer funded that you're really excited about? So many things, um, but I can never call them up on demand. So I'm not going to have good examples. So I'll speak in a kind of general terms. I mean, I think there are people who are taking up how to work in deep collaboration with teachers. I mean, I think about our um, our research practice policy. I mean, our research practice um, RPP, Research Practice Program, <laughs> uh, where we're funding collaborations between systems leaders and researchers, including community, community based organizations, including schools and districts, including higher ed systems, and really watching what those um, groups create and do together is really, really exciting. Um, you know, there, there's just, I mean, people are doing great, great things out in the field. So it's just, it's an, it's an honor to be in this role and be reading so much of people's new work and research. Um, I think what, what excites me most are those new kinds of collaborations and people that are thinking ambas ambitiously about what, what we create. We are so often attuned as researchers to describe what's wrong and to talk about why it's wrong and how it came to be wrong. And we need that. We need that kind of research, certainly. But we also need the research that says, and what would we do differently? What's happening over here that we might build on? What's a policy that worked over there that we could adapt in different places? So that kind of work also um, really excites me. Okay, hey, great. And so a question about how you can make that happen. Uh, Tammy asks, the thinking at Spencer for how you might change the structures of funding to support longer term research that's aligned with all of the points that you've raised. Uh, how should we be better supporting that type of longitudinal, deeply engaged research? Yeah, I have so many thoughts about that, most of which I can't say publicly at the moment because we're, <laughs> we're in the throes of figuring that out internally. Um, so here's what I can say. Um, I can say we are thinking very hard about that at Spencer, both in terms of what we fund through our current programs and what kinds of funding programs we might need. We are thinking hard about that both around our own giving and about the research funding infrastructure more broadly. So we, we one of the beautiful things about this work is being able to work in collaboration with other education funders and other funders of education research to set some collective vision about what we're after. So um, stay tuned, like we have some great things planned that over the next, um, over the next couple of years, you'll see some new, some new programs and new opportunities from Spencer. Hey, wonderful. Uh, we will stay tuned. Uh, two more quick questions here. So one dealing with identity, right? So, uh, so Nitsen writes, uh, I've been working on examining ethnic identity uh, development in Latino adolescents. And as you say, identity is so important for their learning. But sadly, if a school realizes they speak Spanish, 
they're placed in lower level classes. Mm -hmm. So how do you envision the immediate spot or part to start a change? Uh, is it working with local schools? Is it making new policy? Is it after school programs? Is it in the community? Uh, where is the right place to start? Yeah, that's a great question. And many places to start. Um, you know, you're in there, you're doing the work, you kind of see where the openings are. So totally would, would trust your instincts on that. Um, it does strike me that that feels like a pretty straightforward policy question that people may not be aware of how it's impacting students. It reminds me of a, of a situation. Um, I think it was a similar policy in a school one of my colleagues was, um, was dealing with with her, her daughter. And um, they had, well, I won't go into the details, but I think the, the, the broader point is Yes, it is. It can be a very powerful outcome of research and a really important role for researchers in letting the policymakers in a school or district, letting them know how something is impacting families and communities, especially where there are inadvertent consequences that they may not be realizing. And to also think about how they might adapt or change that policy to get at whatever the thing is they're trying to get at. <laughs> but that, that is usually supposed to be about serving families and communities, but to do it in a way that has more integrity and doesn't do harm. So I think that pointing out the harm of the way things are currently working can be a really important role for a researcher that's working in deep collaboration in a, in a school setting. Great, uh, let's go for a very deep research question here. Uh, so Caro is doing some research and is currently revising a paper that's tracing mathematical play from both neuronal structures all the way up to social structures uh, and has gotten some real pushback from your viewers about cherry picking at different theories that don't align well mm -hmm. and is curious in your own work uh, what advice you have for people that are writing across levels uh, from biological substrates to large scale society, societal components? Uh, you do a lot of that. Any tips? <laughs> you know, the first paper I ever wrote that tried to do that, I sent it in to Mind Culture and Activity. And Michael Cole himself wrote me a letter that said that the review started with the sentence, I had great hope when I read the title and it got progressively worse since. <laughs> so I guess I would say persist <laughs> sometimes our ideas need to and he was right it wasn't the best it wasn't it wasn't a completely finished piece of thinking um but but that effort that instinct i had early on to try to think across these different levels i think was the right thing and i think similarly your instinct that these things make each other up right like these things are deeply connected in ways that we don't trace in our research because we tend to do our research at each of the levels and not across it. So I think there's both how you build the theory, and it, sorry, it's Chicago fire trucks. There's both how you build a theory that, that helps your reader understand that cohesion, and then how you design studies across those levels. I think Mary Helen Imordino Yang's work is a really interesting example. I think she does that really well and is one of the, one of the people um, working between like the neural, um, the neurological, the practices and environment and the broader social structures. Emma Adam is another person who does that kind of work. So I think looking to the examples and then I always take reviewer comments as, oh, they didn't understand what I was trying to do. Sometimes the comments are like, you can take them at face value. Yeah, that paragraph didn't work or this thing. But you can see it, sometimes they suggest things that aren't the things you should do, but they give you insight as to what it is about your argument that wasn't clear. So be open as you're taking in the reviewer comments, but not overly compliant, right? Sometimes it's just about where your argument needs to strengthen and use your, use your critical friends, the people around you who love you, but think differently than you. <laughs> if you can convince them, then the likelihood that you can convince an anonymous reader goes up. But, but for sure persist, because this sounds like really, really important work. Great, thank you. Uh, as we're winding down, we have one final question. Uh, and so this is a general one from the audience. The most radical thing that may have been said today is bringing love into the classroom. I think many of us come to our position in education because we're good at knowing and doing school things. Can you say more about the love? Yeah, so I started talking about love and Yolanda Seeley Ruiz is doing some really important and interesting work in this area. 
Um, but I started talking about it when I, the, the book you mentioned in the intro, We Dare Say Love, that's about um, a school district in Oakland, California that started a focus on black male students and created this program to support those students. And, and, it, and it did had great outcomes. Tom D at Stanford did an evaluation study and the outcomes are stellar. But when you look at the how they explain the why of that work, it is about loving the students. And by love, you know, people think about love as like this emotional, fluffy thing. Yes. And when you love someone, you believe in their potential. When you love someone, you hold them to high standards. When you love someone, you see, um, you come to them with grace when there's a behavior you don't understand or something that you feel is, is wrong or needs to be corrected. You're, you're, you're not, you don't come with punishment first, right? You come with understanding where the behavior comes from first. So love comes with a lot of, um, a lot of things in a classroom and school environment. And, and I, I think that it's really hard. I was saying for a long time, you can't learn in places that don't love you. And some elders, um, I think it was Jim Anderson said, mm, you should probably stop saying that because I came up in, the, in, in in an era where you had to learn from people that didn't love you and I did it and it was, you know, so I don't say that anymore, but I will say we know from the, um, from the neuroscience that when you don't feel accepted, when you don't feel as if you belong, you don't feel that engagement and emotional support, it is much more challenging to learn hard, in a hardwired kind of way. So it's, it's super important. And I think we don't, we don't talk about it enough when we're thinking about schools. Elliot Eisner used to say schools have very few soft places. And that's both about you know, the physical environment, but it's also about the emotional environment of schools and classrooms. Excellent. Thank you so much for the comments today. You have given us great hope with practical optimism for the future being a better place. We really appreciate your time. Thank you again. Thank you.